the attack plan, one of the attack plans to get going on changing people's outlook on, on the Bible and to get people more in line with Satan's plan was number one, they were going to introduce, actually going to do several things at once. One was to increase UFO phenomena. At one point, the governments would be saying that it doesn't exist. On the other hand, they were going to increase the UFO, the, the uh, people seeing UFOs. Their people were going to be more, more people were going to be abducted. And this was to get people to, one of the reasons was to get people to think outside of the box, to start looking in physics, which would lead them into metaphysics, which would they would also at the same time another part of the plan was to be teaching darwinism in school from elementary school on up pushing darwinism which is evolution because satan's plan is based on the lie of evolution spiritual evolution physical evolution and that it's spiritual evolution that that pushes the physical evolution that's a lie but that's what satan's plan is that's that's such a diabolical lie so the part is if they're introducing the UFO phenomena and also the thought that there's highly evolved beings that have technology that we don't have, that some of them are going to talk to us and show us the way, then it's going to take us away from the Bible, it's going to get us to follow them. So at the same time, church infiltration. It's also to send in the people like what my mother was doing and to get people to buy into the metaphysics. It's to tell people that they're more highly evolved, that they can understand better. The higher teachings, they aren't higher teachings, There's, they're actually, they're lies, okay? So it's, if you want to study physics, study physics. But the fact is that the, the metaphysics that are being pushed are, and, and through churches, are from the pit of hell, so to speak. They're from Satan himself. And that is part of the plan to get people away from Jesus Christ and the truth that who is Jesus Christ. Tens of millions of people have seen UFOs. Many even recall personal encounters with strange entities. And the popular view is that these are advanced aliens visiting us from far, far away. Hi, I'm John Schneider. This compelling new movie takes a deeper and honest look at the events, the beliefs, the experts, and the people that have shaped our beliefs in all things otherworldly. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. It was the mayhem surrounding the cover-up that created what's been called the Roswell Incident. I had multiple experiences with like little beings in my room. It's global. We have reports now from 140 countries. Our commanders and all told us just keep your mouth shut about it. Join us and live in peace or pursue your present course and face obliteration. In our investigations, we were finding things that we just couldn't get answers for. I was literally thrown into the bed. I cried. Help me, Jesus, please help me. It's one thing to just deny. It's another thing to say, we believe you had an experience, but here's God's take. When one takes a deeper look at this phenomenon, it reveals one of the most disturbing yet powerful affirmations of the truth of the Bible and Christianity. I'm going to be very disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than visitors from another planet, because I think they could be something much more interesting. But here's the first key point. Creationists, evolutionists, you know what? We have the same facts. We have the same rocks, we have the same fossils, we have the same universe to discover, but we come to different conclusions, we interpret those facts differently because our set of starting assumptions, the set of glasses we are wear, has already been put in place before we ever look at the facts. It's our worldviews that cause us to interpret things differently. It's our worldviews that cause us to interpret things differently. Why does this matter? Should we take Genesis literally as real history? 
Well, if Genesis is not real literal history, ladies and gentlemen, with a literal very good creation, with a literal Adam and Eve, and if sin did not literally enter the world through their actions, then you and I don't literally need to be saved from anything. Wow. But what's happened, this interdimensional hypothesis has now sort of really taken on a religious significance because it's showing that, you know, aliens say we're going to evolve to some higher transcendental state. You know, Barbara Marchiniak of the Pleiadians, she says, you know, the Christians are going to get taken off the earth in some sort of rapture type theology to allow Mother Earth to evolve into her next transcendental level. The word evolve is underlining that, that we can also evolve spiritually, for example. I just want to caution here, Christians, when you hear things like the string theory. Okay, I've written articles about this on our website. In fact, three days ago I wrote an article, or I wrote a long time before that, but it appeared three days ago, about multiverses, multi-universes. Let me just say there is not one shred of scientific evidence to suggest this. They're trying to solve the problems of the Big Bang by, uh, by resorting to more and more esoteric and elegant mathematics. Okay? But what happens is people, even well-meaning Christians, think, wow, string theory. This could actually tell us that there are multiple dimensions in which we exist. They could be those spiritual dimensions. Well, I believe the Bible talks about a spiritual dimension. It might have compartments in that dimension, but I'm sorry, I don't subscribe to the idea that there are multiple dimensions to our existence. So here's a quote from the book that I wrote, just to sum it up. The common denominator of both camps, the interdimensional or the extraterrestrial hypothesis, is the belief that evolution has occurred for countless eons all over the earth, all over the universe. This point cannot be emphasised strongly enough. It is the basis for virtually all belief in alien life, whatever form that life might take. But then we've still got to answer what's going on with all of these encounters. I'm sure you know about the Washington UFOs, seen on three separate radar installations, buzzed the Capitol Dome, and then they, the US Air Force went up and they disappeared from view, just vanished. So the Air Force landed, out came the lights again, played cat and mouse. Mexico City, arguably the most well-documented, most watched UFO event in history, where these silvery, shiny-looking metallic craft hovered in downtown Mexico City, dozens of video cameras, thousands of people witnessed to the event. No explanation by the Mexican government as to what happened. They quite openly admitted they don't know what it is. What about this? Messages from beings claiming to endorse an alternative view of origins. Right back there. See, that book is foundational. Genesis talks about the beginning of things. It talks about our Christian doctrine, our need for salvation. Destroy that book and the rest will just topple like a house of cards. Remember I said, where does the truth begin? Okay, so that was Gary Bates. He's from Creation Ministries International. And he's written this book on, called Alien Intrusion, talking about the UFO deception. And uh, they also just put out a, a documentary late last year, to 2017, I believe. And I've been watching a number of different uh, presentations and interviews with him talking about it and to a large degree, he has a lot of uh, good research that he's done, and I was actually kind of surprised to see somebody from CMI getting so in depth into this topic, which is admittedly, you know, one of those it's a it's a it's a rather conspiratorial type of subject, which typically we don't see a lot in creation ministries wanting to to touch anything like that. So apparently he's been doing this for a number of years, and this is uh, nothing really new, but I just was not aware of it. But it's very interesting to think about. On the one hand, he's got a lot of uh, really solid, just from based on that trailer, it looks pretty solid in, in terms of you have the, the eyewitness accounts and the lady talking about calling on the name of Jesus. So obviously they they understand that this is a spiritual phenomenon. These are interdimensional beings. These are... You know, demonic entities, fallen angels, whatever. So, bottom line is they are not aliens. They are not from other planets and other galaxies and other parts of space. And yet, of course, you know, Creation Ministries International and as well as all the other mainstream Creation Ministries still firmly hold to the Copernican model, still believe in space, still believe in NASA, still believe we landed on the moon. And so, it's, it's kind of a weird conundrum. There's definitely a weird tension, and I think it is worth talking about because these it is tensions like this 
that I think are what continue to, to fuel the debate, fuel the conversation, because when you really stop and think about it, it's, it's just a very awkward position to be in, right? To be, on the one hand, arguing that, yes, there's all these other solar systems and other galaxies filled with however many planets out there, but they're all just empty. Like, there's no, there's no life of any kind on any of them, or at least not any sentient life that would have any uh, capacity for morality, because in that case, they'd be part of the creation that has fallen and sinful and then would need to be redeemed, but they can't be redeemed because they're not descendant from Adam, right? So there was a whole conversation that I believe um, that, I, that Gary Bates was having. He was being interviewed by Stephen Bancars, and I really like Stephen Bancars. He's an ex-New Ager who's now a Christian and, and has a lot of great stuff. But he was talking about this, how there's no, <laughs> like how the Bible doesn't allow for the existence of alien life. And so it's it's definitely frustrating from the standpoint of knowing that in terms of the gospel, in terms of so many of the, the theological doctrinal distinctions, you know, a guy like Gary Bates, I'd say, is far more rooted in the truth than, I don't know, you know, how many people who are into the flat earth, who are just all over the map spiritually and uh, still trying to find ways to incorporate aliens into the mix and all this. So at the end of the day, Gary Bates is not a false teacher, right? He's not teaching heresies. He's not teaching, you know, false doctrines that are salvational. But at the same time, it's more of a, a situation of you're still then trying to kind of fit a square peg in a round hole of trying to take the Bible and fit it into this Copernican space when there's really no theological reason for it whatsoever. The only reason for it is because you believe that it has been scientifically proven and that it's fact, and so therefore it and because you also believe the the Bible is true, then they must that they must jive somehow, just because they're two factual things. For no, and that's the only reason is because you refuse to investigate the idea that maybe the globe and space is just as fake as Cro-Magnon Man and evolution and and everything else. And when you get into the the whole UFO alien topic, it's funny because it sort of highlights a lot of these issues too, where he's talking about how it's just so many of these planets are just too far away, you know, just to to reach the nearest star from Earth, according to the Copernican model, traveling at light speed would still take multiple generations of people. So it's just, you're you're separated by so much distance that the idea that there's visitors from other planets is obviously seemingly impossible. But that it's that whole distant starlight problem that comes back comes back around and kind of bites Copernican creationists in the butt because when you know the the, pro, the really the primary focus of so many of these ministries is combating evolution and combating uh, even theistic evolution and old age creationism right and that's a big sticking point which I think is interesting in how much it sort of mirrors it's sort of parallel to the same sort of dialogue and debate that we're having now with cosmology going okay so an old earth creationist and a young earth creationist you're both creationists right so at the end of the day you know you you, you both claim to believe the bible and, and a lot of old earth creationists still believe in jesus and the cross and the gospel but yet but no the as young earth creationists we say no the Bible doesn't actually support that. You're trying to conform the Bible to a, a fallacy, a, sci a scientific fallacy of evolution and all these millions and billions of years. And that matters. That makes a difference. That has an impact. Even if you are professing still faith in Christ and still professing a belief in God and, and want to attach God to, to evolution, it's, it's still not true. You're still allowing massive cracks in the foundation to form and eventually it's going to crumble. So that's the crux of the, the debate between old earth creationism and young earth creationism. And in reality, the cosmology de debate, the whole thing about flat earth versus uh, the Copernican model, in some ways could just be seen as an extension of that, really, by way of acknowledging the fact that you cannot separate these vast distances of outer space from vast expanses of time. And that's the catch-22 that modern young earth creationists who are Copernican... <laughs> We need to find a I need to find a shorthand. Y E C C Young Earth Copernican Creationists? I don't know. 
So people who believe in space and you're trying to you're trying to take a 6000 or a 10000 year old creation you know a a, univ- a cosmos that is in the thousands of years and then explain how there is starlight coming from millions of light years away which should take millions of years to to cover that distance and so of course you have all these kind of convoluted arguments about god creating starlight in transit or or whatever or changing the the laws of physics at the beginning when he was creating in the creation week and all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, you have to come up with something to, to tweak it so that to get around the fact that like if everything just worked the way you say it worked, then those millions of years really exist. You have the, the expanses of time and the expanses of distance are, are inseparable, right? So you have, to, you have to separate them somehow. You have to break that, you know, law of physics that they, they believe in, which is the speed of light and all of that. And it, and it really all just comes back to evolution, of course. And so we're, we have that in common, right? We, ha- we all, we agree with creation.com and with Gary Bates on probably more than we disagree. And that, that I think is what sometimes gets frustrating with all the, the debate over flat earth and cosmology is that sometimes all we can do is you just see people throwing stones at each other and just getting very angry and 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 i feel it too when in many of his talks he he talks about how he was he was such a apollo fan and he he got to go to kennedy space center and it was like just this amazing experience and it's just like you know they're still you know still dazzled by the the nasa propaganda and all that and it's it's hard to listen to that i get it but I think what over time will chip away at those sort of negative perceptions of all these crazy, zealous, angry, self-righteous flat earthers, which I know is how we're perceived and how we're painted and, you know, and sometimes that's somewhat accurate. Okay, but if in the long run, if those of us who are embracing like true biblical literalism and going back to Genesis and affirming that, yes, it, it matters what it says about not just six literal days, but that the sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament and that there is water above the firmament, and we just take it literally in every conceivable way, that this matters, and it matters because of the way it shapes our 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 theology and the way it, it shapes our understanding of the world that we live in now, including things like the UFO deception and how that is part of the broader, greater deception, the spiritual deception, which is the mystery Babylon religion, like like Carolyn Hamlet was saying there at the beginning. I don't know how many years ago she made that quote, but it was a great quote. And how the UFOs, they get people into the paranormal and into the metaphysics, right? And how physics is going to be used to get people into metaphysics. And we see that happening like all over the place. And people embracing one form or another of this quantum spirituality. And of course the aliens are all a part of that, right? The alien, the, the alien deception... Uh, it, it's all about them somehow having higher advanced knowledge and, and advanced technology and whatever whatever's at the bottom of this this quantum technology, this quantum interdimensional mysticism. The aliens obviously are going to be perceived to have already mastered that, and they're going to be the custodians of this higher knowledge, these higher teachings, these higher metaphysics. So that's really the significance of, you know, it's just the watchers all over again, the bestowers of, of the, the wisdom. It's just the repackaged watchers idea. But that's why outer space is a, is a key component of that rebranding of the watchers in their advanced knowledge, right? Because now, before they were, they were angels or they were gods who came out of the sky. So it's just now they're gods who come from, you know, a planet far, far away. So that's my little rant about creationism and UFOs and cosmology. To wrap it up, though, I want to just play this video that somebody sent me a link to. This is uh, Somebody put this together from a presentation by this atheist called Frank Zindler, and this was from 1993. Okay, so 1993, this atheist is talking about how the Bible's been disproven and Christianity has been debunked because of science, and he goes into the cosmology of the Bible. And indeed, how if science has proven otherwise, why that that does take apart the Bible. So again, truth matters, cosmology matters, Genesis matters, the Bible matters. It's all it's it's all a big domino.
As science has grown, Christianity has shrunken. And many fundamental things in Christianity were obliterated centuries ago. And Christianity hasn't quite realized it. It's sort of uh, the walking dead, in my opinion. Let me give you some examples. Um, with the, de the, de the uh, <coughs> development of astronomy, the biblical system of the universe collapsed. The Bible describes a three-story universe. Heaven is a solid sphere, a hemisphere that arches over the earth, the rakia in Hebrew, the firmamentum in Latin, the firmament in the King James Bible. There was water above there, that's why the sky is blue, and somewhere above that is the abode of heaven, of, of God and the angels. We are down here on this flat this earth. The below. Bible is definitely a flat reason. earth book. And yes, below I, us in the subcellar is Sheol, or hell. Above the firmament. Now with the development of telescopes and the discovery that the earth goes around the sun and that the earth is a sphere, some very important biblical ideas were shattered. Heaven, for example, which was a physical thing up there, heaven has gotten lost. Nobody knows where it is. It has moved outside the realm of space and time. It is in some other dimension, I suppose. And like hell, like heaven, hell too uh, has been displaced. Uh, it's no longer down in the basement. It's, it's not at the Mohoravicic discontinuity. It's not in the mantle. Uh, nobody knows where the hell hell is. <laughs> Now, as long as we had this three-story universe with a physical heavens to which the sun and the moon and the stars were attached, the Magi could very easily follow a star, which was not many thousand feet above them. Uh, they could follow the star to the birthplace of, of Jesus. But without the firmament uh, and the stars many light years away, the Magi could not do that. The ascension of Jesus, for example, um, in light of what we really have, that we are a planet flying through outer space, the ascension of Jesus now is seen not to be a miracle, but a simple absurdity. A simple absurdity. Uh, Jesus supposedly lifted off the launching of the Lord. And where did he go? He was thought to be going up to heaven, which was just up there. But in reality, we know he would have been going into outer space. Now, what would he do to survive in outer space? You see, Jesus was still breathing after the resurrection. We are told that Jesus breathed on the disciples to give them the Holy Ghost. And we'll have more to say about the Holy Ghost and Spirit in a moment. But anyway, Jesus was going up into outer space uh, and uh, how he would breathe up there, I don't know. Why a God would breathe anyway is an interesting question. Now, <clears throat> the temptation of Jesus will have to be thrown out. Remember, the devil supposedly took Jesus up onto a high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. Now, that will work if the earth is flat, but it won't work if the earth is a sphere. And then <clears throat> we have the problem of the end of the world, in Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31, we read, The stars will fall from the sky, the celestial powers will be shaken, then will appear in heaven the sign that heralds the Son of Man. All the peoples of the world will make lamentation, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. Now, once again, if all the people of the world are to see Jesus at his second coming, we have to have a flat earth. This will not work really with a sphere. Another thing that goes by the by are these things called angels. In, in Greek, the word is angelion, or angelos rather, and it means a messenger, which is an interesting word when you think about it. Why call these things messengers? Well, in the three-story universe, we had to have communication, upstairs, downstairs, and in the ladies' chamber or whatever, uh, only once in the ladies' chamber. Uh, you all know the uh, uh, visit of the angel to Mary. But um, we, we don't, <clears throat> we don't uh, have any need for angels now that we know they can't climb down Jacob's ladder uh, to get from heaven uh, to earth 
it's again in some other dimension. So this whole thing of heaven, hell, and of course with it the idea of eternal punishment, eternal uh, reward, are certainly uh, very uh, enigmatic ideas. They don't seem to make much sense anymore. Whereas they did make a lot of sense in the world view with which the Bible was composed. It was a pre-scientific world view. to believe when it comes to the heliocentric model is this what you believe because this is what they say is going on the earth tilted at 66.6 degrees from 90 the earth spinning at 1,000 miles an hour the earth orbiting at 66,600 miles an hour the Sun moving even faster through the galaxy as it races towards the so-called galactic center and the galaxy itself moving even faster than that in its ever expanding expansion. And we don't feel it. Is this what you believe? Because this is what they say is going on. Have you never seen photographs taken from high-altitude rockets which distinctly show the curvature of the Earth? Well, they're fakes, sir. They are fakes, every one of them. And I'd like to take the opportunity of making it public here and now that there is a worldwide conspiracy of leading statesmen and scientists to discredit our association and all it stands for, as laid down in its charter for their own secret...